So yeah, thanks all for, for joining us today and um, welcome all of you to the next iteration of the IDA seminar series. Uh, this one is Managing for Great Desert Skink, or as many of you will know, the Chakra, Warana, Jalapa, Muliamaji, Muliamaji, Miji. Miji, Muliamiji. Um, but before we start today, I'd just first like to acknowledge that we are, Rachel and I are hosting from Ananda country, and we pay our respect to the traditional owners of the lands across the desert and the lands that Chakra, the Great Desert Skink, occurs on. Um, we thank people also for managing the country that allows these species to thrive and for keeping Chukapa farms and stores alive. Um, we also should note that almost the entire distribution of the Great Desert Skink is on Aboriginal land. And another thing I want to quickly mention is that yesterday was Sorry Day, and today also marks the first day of Reconciliation Week, um, a time for, for all Australians to learn about our shared histories, cultures and achievements, uh, to explore how each of us can contribute to achieving reconciliation in Australia. Um, joined, as you can see, by Rachel Poultridge, who is a threatened species ecologist with the IDA, and she's working on the new Great Desert Skink Recovery Plan. So I think, without further ado, I'll hand over to Rachel um, to carry this forward. All right. Um, um, thanks very much. So today we're talking about um, the new recovery plan that we've been working on for the Great Desert Skink over the last few months. Um, also a new project that's just starting with the IDA that we got funding for to, to roll out the first year of implementing the recovery plan and showing a, a new video that's been made showing showcasing rangers talking about great desert skinks and um yes so we're just going to show the video and we'll also have an update from the Birley brew rangers who have just done um, a survey yeah. recently on great desert skinks so yeah it's great to see so many people here and hopefully we can get some really good collaborative work going with great desert skinks um this year um, it was really good to have the workshops that we had last year, October, November. We had a series of workshops um, talking about Jakara, Warana, um, to make the new plan. So that stimulated quite a lot of interest and people have already started going out and finding new sites, which is really good. Um, we're also joined today by a postdoc student, David, who's going to talk about some genetics research that he's doing at Uluru. I might hand over to Tim McGrath from um, Department of Environment in Canberra, who really got this new recovery plan going. Um, and if he, he could just give an introduction to, to how we got started and where we go from here. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, sure, Rachel. Can you all hear me and see me there? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, look, firstly, thank you for letting me attend today and inviting me. Um, yeah, Tim McGrath is my name, I'm with the Commonwealth Government and um, I'm, I'm calling in from Ngunnawal country down in Canberra. Um, so yeah, just a bit of a brief overview of, um, of the sort of role that the, the Commonwealth Government plays and I've played in this is that basically um, you'll see there that there was an original plan developed by Steve McAlpin, um, a great desert ecologist that everyone knows pretty well. Um, about two years after the, the national environmental um, law came into place in 1999, um, the Great Desert Skink was listed as a threatened species in 1999 on that act. And two years later, uh, Stephen wrote the plan and it was adopted under the EPBC Act. So that plan has, um, it's been in place um, since, since then. And it's resulted in, um, you know, a lot of um, uh, identity, a lot of funding through our Australian government NRM programs over the years and, and, and raised awareness. But um, while that plan was in place, uh, there's been a lot of great stuff, obviously like IPAs and ranger groups building and lots more information uh, coming to hand um, on Great Desert Skinks. So it was uh, um, something that was just sort of, uh, well, Firstly, a plan expires under the EPBC Act after 10 years. So it came to my attention. I've got responsibility for reptiles and I thought, um, you know, it's really time that we should do a new plan and um, really wanted to make that plan, um, do that plan very differently um, and build on some great work that's been happening with bilbies and night parrots and stuff like that. So what, what we did is... Um, we got um, 
um, I touch base with um, Rachel and Gareth and many other partners across the range of the Great Desert Skink, um, land council reps, ranger group coordinators from KJ and Matu. And we had some telephone conferences and um, got, got everyone together and came up with a bit of a, you know, a bit of an idea and a way forward of how to do this plan differently. And we really, really wanted that plan to be not something that the white fella from the government in Canberra has written. We want it to be something that was um, the voice of traditional owners and what traditional owners um, knew the species needed and, and what they wanted. So we came up with an idea to procure the IDA as an as a overarching service provider and connector of the people in the desert to draft a plan. We chased up some money and we contracted um, Rachel um, and th th with the IDA to start a new plan and um, do that a bit differently and sort of hand over the responsibility to them. And Rachel's been around, obviously, undertaking great workshops and engaging and we've been helping with some record gathering and some maps and getting all that together to inform the process and obviously it's resulted in this uh, great plan that Rachel's going to talk to you about today and um, so that plan is now sort of I understand Rachel drafted and the responsibility comes back to me um, for a while to put that through the government administration processes. Um, so what's required there, we have, a, we have a, a panel of about 12 independent experts and I have to brief that, that panel or committee um, on how we've gone about developing this plan and, um, and, and um, what it means and what needs to be done. And they basically endorse this plan. Um, and we will then go out for a public comment period. So it'll sit on the department's website um, and come with some sort of engagement activities around the plan for three months. So at the moment, we're looking um, for this plan to be in place as a plan that, um, that guides investment and works to save Jukara by around September this year. That's the timeline we're working on. And in September, we have to provide that plan to the, the new federal government minister, whoever that is, to, to make that plan under the Act. And when that's done, um, but not, not necessarily when it's done, uh, maybe in the lead up to that, I have responsibility to try and bring together a recovery team for the Jukara. So to work with the IDA and all the ranger coordinators and rangers to try and bring together a group of people that we can work to sort of steer and and follow that plan for the next 10 years and chase funding, et cetera. So that's about it from me, Rachel, I think. Is there anything else that you wanted me to touch on? No, that's great, thank you. Um, so there's a couple of different opportunities for people to provide feedback um, on the plan. I think it has to go to Threatened Species Committee in a few weeks time, but it's, it's ready to send out now um, if anyone would like to look at it in the next few weeks that would be fantastic but if you don't get a chance to look at it now then when it's um, out for public consultation that would be another chance to provide comments on it. Um, basically we've tried to make it a really practical simple as possible type plan that really just sticks to the core business of what needs to be done to protect um, the Great Desert Skink. Um, there's a bit of research in there, not very much. It's mainly just practical actions. There's a lot about the cultural significance as well, motivating people to, to be involved. Um, but I'll go through the strategies in a minute. But to start with, I thought we'd just show the, um, the video because that gives a lot of background about what great desert skinks are and what the main issues are. So I'm just gonna put that video on now, I think, yeah. What a now and What a now and What a now and for us and bears got Chukurba. The early days they used to eat what an time they don't eat a warana. 
we put camera range. Yeah, so we look after them. Just uh, whatever, you know, coming from Mina Mina, Juru do Tenyingi, that that just dancing place. The dreaming window ten day. You are keep going. That way. Yeah. What an is big same size as blue tongue, but it's orange. Live with his family in one borough. May your mum and dad look after them. Sometimes dad go out, look for the feed and make another borough come back. And they make one one scat on one place. Yeah. So there's different scat you can find next to the borough. There's a big one, small one and the baby one. Yeah. We see when we look for Jalaba, we see Kuna on the side. That we know that's Jalaba and Jalaba area, and we know it's Jalaba area. We don't burn it. We look after it. We do monitoring, camera, like two-way signs. But long time ago, they used to eat Jalaba, but now they're looking after it because it's a native animal, special animal. At Kirikura, we caught a Jukurba song about Blue Tang getting jealous for Jalapa because Jalapa got pretty baby with nice pink nose and Blue tag baby's got an ugly black head. When they danced the Jalapa song, my mum told me how to make the body paint from Jalapa Kuna, white part for Jalapa and black part for Lunkara, Luta. Other mobs have their own Jukurba story, like the Wadi Jakura story from the AP Wildlands. The Great Desert Skink is a threatened species classified as vulnerable to extinction because it's disappeared from a lot of places that it used to live in. Its, it's range is contracted from the edges and it's, um, yeah, it's disappeared from a lot of places people used to find it. So it's now confined to only a small number of widely spaced locations through the desert. We're making a new recovery plan for the Great Desert Skink that's being led by Indigenous rangers um, through the Indigenous Desert Alliance. Um, we've been talking to rangers across the desert to find out what their priorities are for saving the Great Desert Skink and what sort of research they think would be most important um, for the recovery of this species. All our rangers getting together so we can look after Warana. Yeah, and make a new plan out when we go out and to get together. All breeding, lots of little babies, they all safe. Ranger looking for them. The cameras out there, elders leading the way for, you know, mm -hmm. learning young ones up. So we look at the salt lake near the sand dune, so we know where they are. Yep, but we need to pass knowledge to the other rangers as well. So we need more young rangers to come out with us so we can teach them how to look after them properly. We think that the reason Great Desert Skinks are disappearing is from too many hot wildfires burning away their spinifex cover away from their burrows, making them particularly vulnerable to predators, especially feral cats. So um, at some sites we've found really high levels of Great Desert Skink remains in feral cat scats and stomach contents. Big, when big, fire, big wildfire come through, so what I want to say with that spinifex, this cat will be getting them and the dingoes. So we have to do the little fire break next to the borough so Warana can stay safe and the little family. We don't want to make a fire next to the people with a jackal race. Mm -hmm. Don't want to burn the fire because they need protection too, you know? Don't destroy their water. 
We think the most important thing to do is to protect the key sites from fire, so stop the burrows being burnt. Um, and if fire does occur, it's really important to do feral cat control. We go out, look for the cat. Let's get the main thing that lit up all the water now. When we see the cat track, we follow the cat. And when we get to the cat, we get it. So we can save all the water now. The rangers are doing really important work monitoring great desert skink populations, but also managing fire regimes and controlling feral cats around some of these great desert skink sites. Bring school kids too. We teach them kids, young ones, so they can learn. We take them kids there too to teach them. Uh, cultural knowledge at the Tilgra IPA. Yeah, we took some kids out and saw them show the different tracks between Blue Tongue and the Warana. We take kids out so they can learn more about Warana and the Chukurba, so they can pass knowledge to, to, to the kids and the other rangers as well when they become rangers. She beat me, my mother, and young people, young girls, I teach him again. Take the young girls and the elders so they can teach them how to dance and stay with that strong water in a song. Uh, so that, that video is now live on the IDA YouTube channel. Um, so it'd be great if everyone could show it to their ranger teams and um, hopefully get people interested and keen again to go out looking for Jalapa, Warana, Moliniki. Um, yeah, so I'll just talk a bit about the recovery plan now that we've drafted. Um, start with the vision. You heard Annette from Waluna pretty much saying this exact vision in the movie. Um, it's what they said in the Waluna workshop that they wanted Jukro to be safe on country, babies being born, rangers looking after them under the guidance of elders, um, with the support of the broader community. So we've added that populations are strong, healthy, abundant, and genetically diverse, occupying all the sites they were known from in 2022 at this point. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, good. Um, so that's our long-term vision. Our 10-year goal for this um, recovery plan is that we can do enough management and find enough populations, show that there's enough great desert skinks out there, that their numbers are increasing, so that they're not vulnerable to extinction anymore. That is should be the, the goal of most um, recovery plans, to get them off the threatened species list. Um, so to pare this down a bit more. Um, we wanna make sure that the distribution isn't shrinking, it's stable, um, that it doesn't shrink back from what it is now in 2022 over the next 10 years, and that Jukka are still at the same, at least 20 places that we know them from now, and hopefully a whole lot more as we do more surveys. We also wanna see the Jukka populations growing, evidenced by number of um, active burrows there are, at monitoring sites. And ideally we wanna show that there's more than 10,000 um, active burrows. So to achieve this, we've come up with eight strategies um, that I'll go through now. This is based on what we talked about in the workshops, as well as previous research and management that's been done um, over the last 20 or more years. So we thought sort of, the best place to start is with this strategy about motivating and educating people. Um, you can have all the great plans in the world, but if people aren't interested and keen and don't have the resources 
to do the work, it's not going to happen. Um, people had a lot to say about how to motivate each other um, in the workshops. Um, people said that they really like learning from other rangers who are experts um, on Jakara. They find that very inspiring seeing videos or seeing people speak about the work that they're doing, showing the results of um, cat control or fire management that they're doing. Um, they said <coughs> about how important it is to occasionally see Jakara in the hand, so catching them now and again to see how beautiful they are, um, build that connection with them. They talked about uh, the cultural significance of them and learning from the elders, you know, remembering what a special animal they are for people. Other people said that they wanted um, resources on how to find them, how to identify them from the smallest um, skink species that are similar. And doing ranger exchanges was something that people were really interested in. Second survey, second strategy is about surveys, finding where they are. So we can't manage them if we don't know where they are. Um, we know where quite a few are, but there's still a lot of gaps in our knowledge of where they are. And um, I'll just show the map. Um, so the green on this map is where we know they are currently from. The black line around the edge is the historical distribution um, put together, but mainly by Steve McAlpin's records. Um, so that we've got gaps around the edges where there hasn't been any records for a long time, um, especially up in the Northwest. They used to go as far as Broome. People talk about them being around Mullen. Haven't heard of too many in between Mullen and Broome, but undoubtedly they were through that Nordera country. Um, perhaps Yungamata and Karajari, we're not too sure. Oh, yeah. Hang on, Mark. Down in the south. Good. Somebody might need to mute. Oh, yeah. um, down in the south, there's been some new populations found really recently. Lake Wells, the Yilka area. Be good to do some more surveys down there. Burley Baru's recently found them. Marawa's recently found them. So we know that they are more down in this area than were previously known. Um, and in the east, they used to be at Angus Downs, be a good place to look for them as well. There's other gaps in between where it, it would all be great information, but yeah, over the next year, it would be really good to, to find out exactly where they are and then we know where we need to manage them. The third strategy is around fire management. So obviously the two main threats to Jakara that are across the board are unmanaged fire and predation, primarily by cats, we think. Um, so a really important part of the plan is finding where the priority sites are, doing fire management around those sort of priority bur burrow sites, getting that into as many fire management plans as we can. I've got in the recovery plan at the moment, it says at least eight um, annual fire management plans have specific burning for Jakara in there. And then obviously doing the more broad scale burning around them like most rangers are doing with a combination of ground and aerial burning, but actually getting some specific burning happening around burrow sites to stop that spin effects being burned and making them so vulnerable to predators. The fourth one's around cat control. This can't be done at all sites, but um, choosing you know, a number of sites that are accessible can be visited regularly enough to do cat control. Um, a good approach to, to starting is doing camera monitoring of burrows in the springtime when they wake up, um, seeing which predators are actually the ones coming around visiting the burrows and then planning what kind of control is most suitable for your area. Um, this can be a combination of trapping, leg hold trapping, ideally with some good cat tracking first to work out where they are moving. This has been done really successfully at New Haven shooting traditional hunting like happens at Kiwikura, maybe Felix are grooming traps. So part of the, um, the recovery plan and project is having some more cat training camps. Um, we're hoping to have one of those at New Haven this year. And yeah, assisting rangers with working out the best predator control that can be done. So predators and fire are the two main things to deal with, but then there's other small 
you know, in specific locations, there might be disturbances from other things like um, road kills are a bit of a problem in areas with a lot of traffic. Um, pastoralism may be a problem for Jakara, we don't really know. Um, and even over harvesting can be a problem in some areas. It's not generally a major problem for Jakara, but in certain areas when their numbers have been reduced to such small little fragments by cats and fire, any extra mortality can cause local extinction. So um, I guess the best thing to do is get a good monitoring program happening and look at how the numbers are going and which of those disturbances are affecting your burrows if they are going down. Um, as far as um, avoiding, so we're preventing future developments with roads and mining and infrastructure happening. It's really important that proper surveys are done with, with trained people looking for Jakra because they're not picked up in your conventional trapping and camera monitoring. So making sure that there are people who know how to find their sign and often the local ranger group is the best people to sort of subcontract to do those surveys. And this was shown really well down in the Nunnandara lands with the Warburton rangers down there um, contracted to do um, Jakara surveys across the lands in relation to some developments that were happening and they found a whole lot of sites that was really useful information. Um, next one's about addressing emerging new threats, being vigilant, looking out for, for new weed issues. Perhaps camels are a problem in some areas, disease, etc. just sort of looking out for these new things. Um, th through your monitoring program. And then the next one is monitoring, which I keep talking about, which is, yeah, very important to, to keep an eye on what's going on and learn what's happening in your own area. Um, so hoping to, we've already got monitoring happening at, at quite a few sites at New Haven, Kiwikura, Punmu, Uluru, Yulara. It would be good to get more sites doing annual monitoring. And then using really using that monitoring to inform your local management on your IPA or area. But then every five years getting the information all together and looking at the national trends to see what's going on. The last one's about sharing information, um, having more meetings like this, but also having face-to-face -face meetings once a year, maybe sometimes at the IDA conference, sometimes maybe an on-country event. Um, sharing data with each other to learn from each other, also sharing data with the government to help them work out the status of Jakara um, and to help them put appropriate controls on developments and things. Um, but obviously you want to work, work out your data agreement, sharing agreements with the government to make sure that it's, it's done appropriately. Um, so this little diagram here shows how all those strategies fit together. Um, at one end we've got the rangers on the ground um, teaching each other, elders teaching children um, and rangers, scientists providing more information to put everything into sort of more of a national perspective, um, making sure that people care about Jakara and want to look after them. This is going to encourage more people to go out looking for them and looking after them. The more sites that are found, the more sites that can be managed, especially with burning, um, also cat control in some areas. So hopefully also looking after just the health of the country with weeds and ferals, um, making healthy vegetation, plenty of food available for Jokero. And eventually, I guess, we want more babies born and better survival, less animals killed. Um, which will eventually lead to hopefully more great desert skinks, more active burrows. So I don't know if anyone wants to provide any quick feedback now on anything that's obviously missing from that recovery plan, or if anyone wants to let me know if they can have a look over the next couple of weeks, that would be fantastic. Um, and I'll send it out on Monday. Um, but otherwise there is another opportunity in a while. Obviously there's a lot more in the recovery plan than I've just talked about now. There's a, a lot of a summary of a lot more information, background information and studies that have been done over the years, monitoring that has been done, um, maps, etc. But that's basic sort of the basis of the strategies. Does anyone 
want to say anything now before we go on? I'm happy to review, Rach, the recovery plan, the draft recovery plan. That would be fantastic, Danae, and I'll make sure I send it to Steve McAlpin as well next yeah. week. Yeah. Um, and also just one question, is there any minimum standard set out for the monitoring so we can collate the data quite easily? Um, that's in there as needing to be done, yep. Okay. And yeah, is that in there? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about the um, new NESP project in a minute where that's part of that as well. Um, get some more scientific support with that monitoring program to make sure it's robust enough to detect the trends. Yeah. Okay. Good Ta point. Thanks. Um, the Warburton women women can have a look at it as well um, before then. Brilliant. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Have you got their details? I yeah. Do. Thanks, Ali. You know what? Yeah, we'll just um, send me an email next week. If there's anyone else who wants to have a look soon, but yeah. I'll keep going. Um, yeah, well, we've got the Burley Barry Rangers, I think, standing by. They've just done a survey. Um, are you there, Stella? Do you want to talk a bit about what's been going on at Burley Brew with Jackra? Yeah, um, we can talk a bit about the recent trip. Well, um, we've got a little video that one of the rangers made uh, from, from the trip that we can show. That would be great. Right. Okay. Cool. How did you know it was here? No, I see it over there. It's amazing. And it's going to come back this way. And I said, Karen, we're going to get it. But she's singing, it's here. <laughs> <laughs> you.
that work for everyone? Yeah, that was good. So do you want to, do they want to talk a little bit about how the significance of finding that many burrows? And that's a lot more than you found before, isn't it? Yeah, it was a lot more. Um, we've only got MK that was there on that trip. Do you want to say anything, MK? Um, that was my first time. And it was good anyway to get out there and have a look around and found lots. And there we are. Yeah, that's great. Was that, that was a ranger exchange trip, wasn't it? Did you have some other rangers? Yeah, trip? we had two rangers from uh, Wakamura who are an emerging ranger team come out um, and and help with the surveys as well because they I think they've got some historical records on their country that they're hoping to go visit um, and, and see if they're still there as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, like MK said, it was good to go out and we, you know, we've visited three different spots where we'd found them before, but we found, we did big long walks and uh, found a lot more burrows than we had previously. Um, we were meant to do the trip earlier, but because of COVID, it had to be kind of pushed back later into the year. So there wasn't as much activity and, and tracks and stuff around because it was a bit cooler. Um, so yeah, we'd like to go back and, and see it when it's a bit warmer, see if we can see some more tracks around. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. Good follow up from when we had that workshop there at Waluna back in October last year. Yes. Yeah. Good to see. Yeah. And yeah, the video is lovely. Just showing, you know, when you're out there looking for jackara and other things, you can also be hunting, looking for bush tucker and finding emu eggs. And you can just fit it in with a whole lot of other things that are priorities for rangers when they're out on country. So a good example of that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I need to share my screen again. So, yeah, now we'll just talk about, we've got a new project that we um, had funded through the Environmental Restoration Fund, I think it's called Priority Species Grants that came up last year. So they were um, offering funding for species that are in the Threatened Species Strategies Top 100 Species. And luckily Great Desert Skink got into that list this year for the first time. So that opens up a a whole lot more opportunities to get funding through different um, government grants. And the IDA put in this application, we talked to various partners last year about putting together a collaborative application to start rolling out implementation of the recovery plan. Um, so that's just starting now, it goes for 12 months. And basically it um, supports the position that I'll be doing with IDA. So um, I'll be starting this position next week pretty much as a threatened species ecologist with the IDA available to support rangers doing um, threatened species work. And for the first 12 months, 0.5 of that job is actually working on, on Jakara. So if anybody wants any help with doing field surveys or providing any resources, um, we can do that, give us a call. Um, the things that we listed in the as the actions for this for this project over the next 12 months were based on the priority things people raised in the workshops. So um, producing those resources, supporting ranger exchanges like Stella was talking about. Um, we're you know a new ranger team that isn't might not be too sure about whether they've got great desert skinks or not can go visit another group. That, um, experts on them and um, learn from them or you can invite other skilled rangers to your country to help do a survey. Um, we're also hoping to yeah have a cat control training camp, you can support some burning, you can also if you need extra funds to record Chukaba songs, stories, anything like that, um, we can help with that and yeah but 
basically we're hoping to get a whole lot more surveys done this year and then set up a good monitoring program that we can roll out next March. And we've been talking for a while about having sort of a Mulyamidji March um, monitoring time when a whole lot of groups go out together in the same week and do their monitoring. And so it builds a bit of excitement. Groups can get together online first to talk about it, have a bit of rivalry, who can find the most burrows and then get back um, together afterwards and talk about how it went. So that's what we're aiming for, to um, identify more sites during the year, ready to start actual proper monitoring where, of, um, of sites next March. Um, so yeah, if anyone wants any help with that, I think we've already planning to do some trips with APY, um, but there's still plenty of scope and I'll start scheduling those trips next week. So get in touch with that, um, with me if you want some help there, either funding or someone to come out and give you a hand. Um, there's also a new project through the new NESP, um, National Environmental Science Program, Resilient Landscapes Hub. Um, We've managed to slip a project in um, that's just pretty broad at the moment called Research to Support Management of Priority Desert Threatened Species. And the idea with that is it um, can provide extra scientific support for setting up good monitoring or doing other research that's really relevant to, to managing threatened species, um, great desert skink in this case. So, yeah, um, we're going to be sort of refining what that project's going to look like over the next three months. But yeah, there's potential to bring in other scientists who are really good at, you know, the data analysis or the modelling or whatever we need help with um, to make the science behind the work more robust. Um, and yeah, that can bring more funds as well for projects that are co-designed with ranges based on what rangers need and want. Um, and yeah, so that's good. Um, there's another a research project that's actually already happening down at Uluru, um, a DNA project. And I think David's here somewhere. I'd like to invite him yeah, to just... Around. Hi. <laughs> I'll just stop sharing. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Thu, and I'm joining you today from the Ngannawal country. I'm a research fellow at the Australian National Wildlife Collection at CSRO. And today I'm going to give you a summary of a new method that we, that my team at CSRO and in partnership with, uh, with the Parks Australia, the Anangu people, and the Australian National University are developing to monitor the great desert skins. But before I begin, I would just like to mention that I've used a similar method to uh, monitor cheetahs in Africa. And we are currently using the method to monitor other large carnivores uh, like lions and leopards. So today, uh, many people use a combination of these methods uh, uh, to, to monitor reptiles across the world. And although these methods are very important in providing ecological and biological uh, information, they are limited uh, because most of them are time consuming. I'll give you a case for our cheetahs in Kenya. Cheetah can move for hundreds of kilometers uh, within a week. So trying to follow them every day takes a lot of time. And most of them are, can cause injury and death to, to the target species, and I've seen this with, uh, with trapping. When you're trapping individuals, they tend to, you can either permanently injure the, the individuals that you are trying to capture or even, um, or even kill them. And most importantly, many may not even tell you the information that you're looking for. Uh, to address some of these challenges, we have joined hands with, uh, with this incredible organization, the Parks Australia, the Urukata Juta National Park, uh, Australian National University and uh, Jakura Rangers in Urara. And our method, uh, this method that we are proposing, we will use uh, eDNA that is shared by the Jakura into the environment uh, that is in the soil, in the air, or in the surface water. And this means we do not have to capture, we do not need to capture the Jakuras to get the biological samples from them. 
So just to give you a brief uh, overview of how the project or how the method works is uh, all living all living organisms, the Jakula people and everyone uh, leaves traces of DNA in the environment. That is in the soil when walking, uh, for example, in water when they're drinking and in air. And if we can collect this genetic uh, material for Jakula, we will be able to provide information that is uh, that is not possible to generate using other methods and uh, without causing stress to the individual things like handling and having to return them to the balance of stuff. And some of the exact some of the example of the things that we can be able to tell with the eDNA thing from the soil and from the air would be how many chakura, for instance, how many chakura live in a, in a barrel. And this method will be able to pinpoint uh, even the family structure, how many males are uh, living in the barrel, how many females. And also we'll be able to, like you mentioned about the predators, with this method we'll be able to tell the predators that visit the barrels without having to analyze many kind of uh, camera traps, images. So we'll just be able to pick the DNA in the, in the, in the barrels. Uh, also, we'll be able to tell how far the jacula move. That will be in relation to fires after fire burns or where they're establishing new barrels, how far do they move and in which months. And this, I think, will have some any implication in when you formulating methods on how to uh, do the target burning. Also, we'll be able to tell uh, what jacula eat, like specifically tell them this is what they are eating and in this season. And I think we can use that kind of information and proxy of where to find the jacuras and which ones. Uh, this project, some of the benefits of this project is that we generate data that will inform the park activities. Again, for instance, the banning such as fire management will be able to tell the jacuras this class of patterns, uh, uh, which we can help in banning strategies. But another, another most important thing is this project will give us an opportunity to get out in the country and learn and share knowledge with, uh, with the communities and other Japura ranges. And for instance, in our last trip, we went to, we were in Urara and uh, we managed to uh, interview or to participate in Japura surveys in the IPA. And I believe that if this in eDNA data can be uh, used alongside the indigenous knowledge on Chakura, it will help us formulate a long-term conservation uh, strategy for these species. Uh, some hits and misses on this project so far. Uh, in February, I think two months ago, we visited Ulara. And with the help of Rangers, the CLC, and park staff, we managed to collect 38 samples from 11 Chakura barrels. And we collected a small amount of, for this, we were collecting a small amount of uh, soil samples and uh, scat samples from the communal. These samples into with me to Canberra, and I've been working with them in the lab trying to see whether we can get DNA from the Jakura. And the great, the great news is we are getting uh, Jakura DNA. And from this image, I'll show you, uh, I'll show you. This image, the bars that you're seeing here are showing that we are getting uh, skins, both from soil and, um, and start samples. But something that we've noted is that with the soil samples, we are, we, the DNA yields are a little bit lower. And for this, we've, uh, we've thought it's because we were just getting the soil and putting it in tubes, we were not preserving it, and then bringing it into country maybe five or six days after collection. So to kind of circumvent these, I've uh, seen these kind of uh, papers. So these papers will be able to preserve DNA. So what this, how this paper work is we get uh, some small amount of soil and put it into like a container with water and let these uh, papers sit for five minutes. And then with that, this paper, you can save it or you can preserve it in any conservation, uh, any preservation media and be able to transport it uh, anywhere across the country. And with this, we'll be able to preserve the DNA uh, in the soil. Uh, the next step, uh, this meeting was very timely, Rachel, when you invited me, because we are heading back to URA next week, and we'll be there for 15 days. And we'll be working alongside uh, the park staff, the Jakura Rangers and CLC. And for this, we are planning to get more barrels. Last time we managed to get 11 active barrels, but most of the barrels that we got outside there, the outside 
uh, in other areas who are not active. So this uh, this season we're planning to get more Jacura virus in other plots within the IP uh, within the park. Uh, we are in the program. We are in the process of also getting a required permit so that we can survey Urara and IPA. And these two sites are very important for the uh, population within the park because they are adjusting to the park, and with this, they will be able to understand the movement of Jacura, whether they are moving into the IPA or uh, going back into the parks. And the overall goal of this project will be to come up with a reproducible method that we can add into what uh, all the rangers are using to monitor the jacuras. And with this method, we can use it across all the areas uh, from Central Australia all the way to Western Australia. And we are looking to collaborate with all the ranger groups. So we are keen to join you when you're doing your surveys and we can get big uh, soil samples or we can pick samples and try and see, compare our results and what, uh, what the indigenous uh, uh, knowledge is. And finally, I'd like to leave you with this photo that I took with Mani last, last, um, last field one. And uh, I just took that photo because uh, Mani had a uh, good uh, uh, skills on how to identify the virus, which I think will be a good, uh, a good thing when we are going back to the, to the park or to the IPA to have uh, rangers helping us trace the barrel or see the barrels where the barrels are. I have my email here. If you would like us to join you in your surveys, we can come and try and help you. So Molly Atima is also the artist that designed the Chakra Ranger logo as well. Oh, Molly, yeah, he mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, he mentioned that. His knowledge about all the Chakra I was very happy with uh, working on HD to do during the 15 days that we were there. Thanks. David, yep, that's great. So how will you actually work out how far the jacara are moving just if you happen to find the DNA of the same animal at another site after it's moved? You'll... Oh, yes. So the plan or the plan of this project will be to sample across different seasons. So we'll be able to get, if we get a DNA at point A, we'll be able to say these jacara have moved from that place to the other area because of the DNA signature. Yeah. But we are also happy to get any kind of uh, question that you would like us to answer with the eDNA question, because with this one, we are getting individual based information. Yeah, so you'll be able to look at relatedness between populations as well with that, will you? Like, um, yes, yeah. Right. yeah, that will be part of the main study, getting the population structure and seeing uh, the genetic status of the population within the park and of course the IPA further out as well yeah That'd be good yeah that's pretty much all i had on the agenda today i think um we can open it up to any further discussion if anyone else has got anything else they'd like to raise or question or ideas and also do any groups have any planned work this year already say so thank you for doing this it's been an, an amazing seminar today and, and thank you for all the work that you've been putting towards this, like for a few years. Like, yeah, I remember joining a um, conference call with Tim a couple of years ago and it's great that now Rachel and Adia are all on board and I'm really excited, like it's, like it's happening. Mm -hmm. So we're very looking forward to working together and get more done. Yeah, so thank you, big thank you. Oh, thanks, Caro. Yeah, it'd be really great to get back to Wataru and see what's going on down there. So yeah. do you think you are likely to be a possibility this year? Yeah, hopefully, yeah. Yeah, we just need to lock it in soon. Yeah, just let's... discuss when the best time is to do it. And yep. we're very keen. Great, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So are there any questions for Rachel or for Tim or David while we have them online or questions for Biriliburu who have shared some of their work out in the field? Sorry, and thank you, David. Nice to meet you and great presentation. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, if there's not many more questions, we'll, um, we've been recording this session, so we'll make it available online. Part of that we'll share 
the video resources we've been given along with the, um, the recovery plan as well. Um, obviously, my thanks, especially to, to Rachel for putting a lot of effort into this seminar series event, but also to Tim, to Stella and the Biriburu Rangers and to David for your participation. Um, thank you all for joining. And so if there are no more questions, I think we'll um, wrap up on this Friday, Arvo, and go and enjoy our weekend. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you very much, everyone. It's been great. Thanks All for right. your support from Canberra. No worries. All right. Well, well, thank you, Rachel. Thanks all again then, and we'll um we'll see you at the next one of these. Yep. Thank you. <laughs>